Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Great. So, um, as was mentioned, my experience is in family practice and long-term care. So I want to touch on um, frail elderly who are my main focus and um, the, the folks that I care a lot about to protect, especially in the context of me. Um, and as Dr. Herx mentioned, they often see themselves as a burden to others or, or even see themselves as disposable. Um, and it's easy to see that because they're literally needing to be lifted from bed to chair and from uh, chair to the bathroom. And so their feeling of being a weight is quite a literal one. And so the way that we provide care and not only for us as physicians, because we're not doing the lifting, but the care team, the way that the team provides care is how we can show the frail elderly that they're not a burden to us, that they're not a weight on us, but they're a joy to take care of even when they have behaviors and they have uh, kind of dis difficult aspects in care, uh, we have to have an ethic of care that allows them to feel weightless, to feel like they're not a burden. Um, and even then, there will be dark moments that we have to accompany them on, and we have to be willing to go to those dark places with people. Um, I've used the expression before, I think even last year, that we need to be willing to go to hell with people. And once we're there with them in, in hell or how they perceive it, uh, we have to be able to give them that life-saving hand to lift them back into a place of light and, and joy and peace so they can get back to that uh, business of living that Dr. Herx mentioned. Interestingly, when uh, Dr. Herx and I were talking about this the other day, she brought up a CMAJ article that came up uh, last month one of the authors is, interestingly enough, a Liberal Party candidate. So you can imagine there's a bit of bias there. Um, and in the article, they bring up how in frail elderly, specifically the, my population, that we need to be able to have um, uh, geriatricians and people who have experience in, with frail elderly to help with um, informing future made legislation. But the way that they frame this in their article in uh, the Canadian Medical Association Journal last month was that um, the, the idea is that we help to ensure that frail elderly have access to MAID. Um, and interestingly, one of their comments was consultation with uh, geriatricians may lend confidence to the fact that there are complex issues at play in MAID assessments, but they point out that some geriatricians and elderly care specialists like myself are conscientious objectors to made. So the implication there is that, you know, they want us to inform these policy decisions, but we may be conscientious objectors. So note the bias there. So it's, it's interesting how the envelope keeps getting pushed, especially with the expansion of made with last year's legislation. Um, and uh, interestingly, the, the idea that access is, they, they've mentioned the fact that access to geriatricians or, um, uh, geriatric specialist is limited and may delay the completion of made assessments in a timely manner. So they, they've clearly got a bias and have an approach to made that wants to kind of widen the doors for frail elderly uh, instead of protecting frail elderly, which would be my agenda. Um, so a few points I want to touch on today. The first would be about uh, critical conversations about suffering in the frail elderly and then uh, responding to suffering uh, by, by presence. Um, so in interestingly, the critical conversations that we want to have with people who might be exploring the idea uh, of, of euthanasia or assisted suicide is, it can be at times frightening, especially for a medical student or a resident who hasn't encountered this before. Um, and a medical student friend of mine contacted me last year because he was on an internal med rotation and his uh, supervising resident told him that, you know, we have to consult the, the MAID uh, assessment team because this patient is wanting to uh, consider MAID as a treatment course. And so the medical student was quite anxious about it because he was taking care of this patient and he wanted to know what his approach should be. And we discussed it together. And I said, you know, just continue having these exploratory discussions. There's really no need to be worried 
uh, to just have an open mind and, and kind of explore the idea with people to certainly ask, you know, where is this coming from? What do you need? And in fact, the resident that the senior resident had misinterpreted the patient who all they wanted was pain control and they didn't feel like their pain was well controlled and they did not ask for the made assessment team. They, they um, were misunderstood, but sometimes what can happen in a setting where learners are trying their best to be politically correct, sometimes they jump the gun and will uh, kind of say, you know, let's just get the made assessment team involved because they don't want to have some of these difficult conversations with patients, um, especially because it can be politically charged and there might, they may be worried about what their preceptors think or the, the attending physician might think. So they wanna just um, ship it off to the made assessment team. I would say instead, and this is what I encourage the med student to do, we need to be willing to have these conversations, even as learners, if we're a med student or resident, because the patients need us in their lives. And if we are the only person that can speak life to this situation and not kind of hurry the process of made along, uh, we might be that one opportunity that they have to really go deeper into some of these difficult conversations and difficult thoughts that Maybe there's nobody else but us that can speak to them about this. And I would say even for, you, for those of you on the call who are learners, you really have nothing to fear, even if you feel like you're at the low end of the totem pole. You don't have anything to fear because um, the decision doesn't stop with you, especially when you um, kind of uh, foster that ability to, to explore difficult questions in a very open-ended way and just allow the patient to express themselves. And you're just there recording their thoughts and just listening to them in a very compassionate way. So in the end, my friend was able to clarify for this patient, even though he was, again, just a medical student um, following the patient, he was able to clarify that this patient did not request made, he just wanted uh, adequate pain control and they were able to move things in a different direction. So I wanna give you guys a lot of encouragement in, in realizing that no matter where you're at, uh, even if you're not you know, a medical student, resident or a physician, if you're a nurse or anybody else on the care team, that if uh, within your scope of practice, if you have these conversations in a way that is open to hearing whatever the problem is, you are always going to do good for the patient because they need us in their lives at those moments. There's a reason that we're in people's lives to help them through these difficult moments. Um, and uh, the, the, the main point, if you forget everything else that uh, I say tonight, I think the main point to really understand is that for us who would be opposed to euthanasia, the biggest thing that we need, the, the biggest point we have to make is that our position is to protect patients and it's not to object to anything that our patients are talking about. Um, we are totally willing to have difficult conversations to talk about what, what is made, what, what is um, um, a made assessment team. We can, we can answer all of these questions and provide information. But at the end of the day, we want them to know that we are there to protect them and to love them and to really uh, care deeply about them. And in my experience at my nursing homes, when um, patients are, know that we care deeply about them, uh, the, the requests for made seem um, to be uh, insignificant in the face of excellent care. So my nur nursing home patients, I see them every week, and I have a gentleman who's a quadriplegic who was asked about MAID on a few occasions, and uh, he said he would just like to think about it. And so we've processed it together, we've thought about it, and um, he knows that it's not available on our site. Um, and instead of trying to think like, how can I avoid the conversation with him because I'm afraid of it? Um, I would like to be the one having the conversation with him to, to ensure he has the right uh, perspective on things rather than bringing some external person that he's never met before in to do an assessment because uh, I'm a little bit nervous uh, about how that could go and how, how it might impact me and my career. In fact, I, I think it's good for him as a patient to hear me as his attending physician and what I think about what he might need. And 
in, in, in every case, whenever I've had to explore these discussions with my patients, there's always an opportunity to find an unmet need or something he, uh, he or she might benefit from, uh, you know, whether it's rec therapy or, you know, th this particular guy likes to go with smoking. So, you know, people need to light his, he'll, he'll ask a passerby to light his cigarette. He knows that I refuse to light his cigarette because I'm his doctor. And so I won't go there, but somebody else will. What I'm trying to say is that if we're willing to find different unmet needs and address the things that are really distressing to people, um, they're going to see that compassionate care and they're going to be willing to um, uh, see that our side of the care and not necessarily have the same level of distress. The uh, second thing that I think is important to talk about is responding to suffering with presence. So, uh, so several of my patients have issues with chronic pain and we need to deal with their pain. But the, the, the sad realization for me and for my patients is that we can't always get to a zero out of 10 pain level. So how do we accompany people who don't have perfect pain control, um, but still feel like their suffering is being alleviated? And the reality is that a lot of people can learn to live with three or four out of 10 pain um, through good care and knowing that their needs are being met. That could include having uh, companions being with them, uh, having uh, kn knowing that I'm there when I tell them that I'm coming back next week. If the thing that we're trying this week doesn't work, I will be back next week and we'll try something else. So this idea that I am always available, they know that the nurses can call me anytime, that is a, a, a life raft for a lot of people that they know that I'm going to be there. Um, I'm, I'm the, the attending physician for these this group of patients um, with, without any rotation. I'm always there for them. So then they know that they, the nurses can get a hold of me. So that type of um, compassionate care for me as a physician, but also integrating that with the team of nurses and healthcare aides and the rest of the staff, the nursing home, all help to uh, create a culture of care where um, made, even though it's legal, is almost unthinkable. It's not unthinkable because people still think about their, the end of life and we still need to be willing to have those conversations, but it doesn't kind of come to the point of, uh, let's get an assessment and let's, let's try to deal with the arrangement. So since euthanasia has been legalized, there has never been somebody who's ever wanted a made assessment on any of our sites. And I attribute that to our care team, right? So they, they know they're self-selected because I work at a Catholic institution, but um, besides that self-selection, even among the people who are inquiring and exploring the topic of euthanasia or, or medical assistance in dying, if we have those conversations in the context of a very loving care team, then I think um, it's something that doesn't have to be a reality, even though it's legal. Not all legal things do have to come to fruition. So I, I'd like to say that even though something might be legal, like MAID, for example, um, we can make it such that for the individuals that we take care of, it's not something that they're even interested in because of the excellent care that we provide. That might be an oversimplification, but it is my experience in my nursing homes. So I guess the point here is even when there's uh, what, what you might call intractable suffering or suffering that involves pain that goes down to, doesn't go down to zero or more existential pain, um, the, all of those things can be addressed by a, a very loving, caring presence by a care team, including physicians and nurses and others, um, really getting involved in uh, rehab teams like the, the physio care teams and the rec therapy care teams. All of those things help to integrate an ethic of care that makes people not want to request euthanasia because they're able to enjoy their lives. And lastly, I have to mention, and, and Dr. Herx mentioned this as well, the importance of engaging families, um, not only to help them be involved in the care of their loved one, but also for the sake of um, the reality is that the main interest that we have to manage is not just on the level of the patient, but also on the level of the family. So if the family's interest in MAID is the one that is influencing the patient, 
if the family gives the impression to our patients that they are a burden, then certainly the patient's going to feel that in a more significant way. So we have to engage families and make sure they're on the same page and feel like their loved one is taken care of. Because if they have um, kind of a, a, a mind that wants to fast track their loved one on, on a path to MAID, uh, that's going to be much harder to deal with if the care team is not on the same page. And if we don't engage families and they don't see that we have this very loving and excellent level of care that we can provide. So um, we don't have to be worried about intractable suffering if we're able to provide compassionate care and accompaniment. Uh, our, our presence is going to um, bring that baseline three out of 10 pain to zero just by being a presence that is loving and caring for our patients. That's it for me until the round table.